Let's open our Bibles tonight to Ezra chapter 8, please. Ezra chapter 8. I've had several people ask me about our uh, wacky jacket day, or whatever it's going to be called, our sport coat, suit coat, whatever. Uh, I don't have a date scheduled for that. A number of people have told me that they are making preparations. Uh, and so if you are, then let's get ready. I'll try to let you know as soon as I possibly can. All right. Continue with the theme of revival along the lines of what we've been in in Nehemiah and looking at what would be necessary for us to have revival as God's people. And so I think it's perfectly appropriate to look at, of course, uh, historical events where you see revival happening, what we could define as revival. And what happened in Israel post-captivity uh, during the times when Daniel acknowledged and prayed to God in Daniel chapter 9 that the captivity was over and he looked for God to work now, for God to do something to restore God's people. And when you had men like Ezra, when you had individuals <coughs> like four, more than 42,000 people that went back from the captivity into Jerusalem and then began to rebuild the temple, set up worship of God, uh, all those things, ultimately coming down to uh, the time when the temple began to be rebuilt. And of course, if you were to read Zechariah, Haggai, you know, you'd see some more about that. One of the things that really was amazing that happened in the time of Zechariah as well was uh, the, the underlying theme was Zerubbabel. You remember Zerubbabel, that, the king, that actually if you were to ask a question, what king in all of Israel would have been number one in pleasing God? And if you study Zechariah, you'll see it's Zerubbabel. A lot of times we think a lot about David, we think a lot about Solomon, we think a lot about Josiah, and there's some good kings that uh, Judah had, but Zerubbabel had a very, very special place in God's heart, and one of the reasons for that, if you study Zechariah, is because of the heart he had for revival. And so there's some good leadership, actually, in this day. Now keep in mind that of the captivity that returned to Judah at the end of the captivity of those that returned, there would have been more than 42,000 plus the remnant which had remained there in Jerusalem. And so keep in mind that it was only a few that led in revival, but that the whole nation experienced revival because of what happened because of the leadership. And we said as we studied through Nehemiah that it only takes one person to have revival. One person can have revival. And I will continue with that theme by saying it only takes a few to lead in revival, and Ezra would have been another one of those leaders. And so uh, perhaps for a couple weeks, but at least for tonight, we'll look at some things in Ezra. In chapter 8, I'd like to look at verses 21 through 23, and we'll pray and ask the Lord to teach us this truth that I believe is a nugget of importance about revival. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So it's chapter 8, we read verses 21 through 23, now we'll pray. Lord, now that we've read this passage of Scripture, I pray that you would grant to us a balance and understanding for it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I uh, believe that this little portion of the Scripture this evening is a truth that ought to shape our way of thinking. And ultimately, what we're going to see this evening is that one of the concerns, or the major concern, with along with the understanding that there needed to be revival, was first of all, that God's people saw that they needed. In other words, God's people saw that they needed a nation. They saw that they needed the temple to be rebuilt. Ezra's all about uh, 
really the people coming together as a nation in the beginnings of the temple being rebuilt, they saw that that, that was a need. And why was it need, a need? Because they needed a temple to worship God. They needed God. And a people who see themselves as destitute, a people who see themselves and realize that without God, nothing is worth anything, nothing matters, are a people who see themselves as needy. I think oftentimes the greatest hindrance to revival is satisfaction with things being the status quo. In other words, if you had to ask the question, if things always continued as they are and as they have been, would that be okay? And you know that's a tough question for folks that have grown up in the United States of America. It's tough for us because the fact is, is that things have been pretty easy for us, haven't they? Now, I know that there are, I recognize that circumstances individual to every one of us, by the way. If you've gone through tough things in life, don't think, well, you know, I'm the only person that's gone through tough things in life. Everybody does. Everybody does. Matter of fact, you probably wouldn't dream of some of the things I've gone through, and I probably wouldn't dream of some of the things you've gone through. But as far as our circumstances in life goes and outlook and so forth go, the truth of the matter is being, uh, being alive at the age in which we are, things have been pretty easy. I don't want to get political. Things could change at any time, but they've been pretty good for most of us. And I don't think that anyone here, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think that anyone here uh, is missing meals. Or, you know, most of us even in our church are not struggling with debilitating things. Perhaps we will. Perhaps we have. But right now, things are manageable. If you had to ask, if circumstances were to continue as they are right now in my life, what would be my quality of life, quality of living, humanly speaking, compared to other times in history and compared to other nations and places in the world, our quality of life is stellar. It's unbelievable. Probably no one today went to bed last night trying to just scour their mind for something that they could come up with for food. Nobody thought, you know what, if I were to get a transformer and get the oil out of it, the grease out of it, mix it with mud, maybe I could eat that for food. Or if I could find a belt somewhere and grind it up, I could eat the leather of it. And then I, maybe that would keep me alive for another day. That's normal for people. I mean, that's literally normal for a lot of people in the world today. Not for the United States. 40 for, or, uh, I think 42% of the food of the United States, I think that's the stat, uh, gets used. The rest of it goes to waste. 58% of our food goes to waste. That's how much we have. Now, the reality of it is, is that, you know, I realize everybody's not wasting the same amounts and so forth, but that's, those are the stats. Those are the statistics that somebody somewhere said are true. And, you know what, I have enough experience to know that probably <coughs> it is. When you buy something, the built-in cost of waste is in it, you know, or things could be a lot cheaper. Now, again, don't go, go off and get political there. God's blessed us. That's why, actually. That's actually why. But folks, I'll just tell you something. People despair of life when they have plenty to eat, plenty of money, and their circumstances are just fine because there's more to life than food. And there's more to life, more to the life that God has given us on this earth um, than things that can be achieved or can be possessed. And many of the, the children of Judah could have remained in captivity if they'd been satisfied with the status quo. The truth of the matter is, Nebuchadnezzar was a very good king and ran things pretty well. People under his empire did pretty well. Uh, Cyrus was a good, pretty good king. Darius was a pretty good king. As far as that goes, I'm talking about as far as being a Jew goes, Artaxerxes was a good king. And being in Judah and rebuilding an outlying province like Judah, as far as 
the need to be there or things being better circumstance-wise there than being, you know, back in Babylon or Persia or wherever you want to call it. Things weren't better there. But what was missing in those kingdoms, hear me now, was God. And actually, every one of those secular kings, that is, kings who were not Israel, acknowledged that what was needed was the God of Israel. Matter of fact, along with the request, for instance, that Cyrus gave, if you'll read in Ezra, when the king authorized out of his finances the rebuilding of the temple for timber, for labor, when, he, when they authorized for the vessels to be taken from the treasury of the king and to go back into uh, the temple, when the king authorized those things, along with that, he said something along the lines of, and please pray for the king and his sons when you build the house of God. In other words, the king realized, I need God. I need God's blessing. Even though he wasn't Israelite, even though he, uh, he didn't have a personally vested interest in the temple being built, he acknowledged, I need God. I need God's blessing. I've seen that somewhat with our current president, who I would call a lifetime godless individual. Our president for his lifetime has been godless. It, it uh, was a matter for some humor when he was campaigning in the primaries last year. Do you remember when he tried to identify with Christians? and how awkward it was for him to do so. And he'd say things like 2 Corinthians, or I am one of you. And he would use pronouns that exclude himself to include himself. And, uh, you know, he would say things like, you know, the Bible just means so much for me. I've got a room full of Bibles. And, uh, you know, he you read it. Well, you know, he obviously knew he didn't. <laughs> but there was something about it where... You know, you felt like, okay, so he's trying to politicize Christians. He's trying to use evangelicals to get out the vote. And it frustrated me that evangelicals went for that. It's very interesting, though, that in the office of president, actually, he has been so conservative morally incredibly morally conservative so far. He's taken stands. Right now he's fighting contraception. Uh, he's, he's, he's just being, it, there's no political capital in it for him to stand against Planned Parenthood, and he is. He's standing for, he's taking moral issues, taking the side of moral people. Uh, we have yet to see how it will shake out, but his Supreme Court appointment was as conservative as anything you could pick. I mean, you just couldn't have, you, you, you know, my concern was, okay, here's a godless guy. How in the world is he going to pick somebody, select someone? And you know, his VP selection was a born-again Christian. Mike Pence, like blatantly born again. And uh, blatantly, very, very strong anti-abortion, pro-life. Somebody help with that door. Knock louder. But he did lock it, didn't they? Charlie, why'd you do that? Sorry about that, frankly. We didn't mean to lock you guys out. Why would someone who doesn't claim necessarily to be born again want to declare a national day of prayer and declare things to be uh, days of prayer and so forth? Why would he do that? Well, I think in many ways he sees the need for God's blessing. Knowledge is the need for God's blessing. The same was true with secular rulers in the times of, of uh, Ezra and of Nehemiah and Haggai and uh, Ze Zechariah. These guys who are contemporaries. And it's important to see actually the attitudes of Nehemiah and Ezra as they corresponded with the secular kings of the day. It's interesting that they wrote letters of appeal. They accepted authorizations and fundings. I mean, you want to preach separation of church and state, don't ever read Ezra or Nehemiah. 
Just don't. Because the king paid for the temple to be rebuilt. And that's not separation of church and state very much. So, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so, if you're one of the uh, people that are anti-government and, and so forth, and I don't want to identify any particular groups that have to do with that, let me just tell you something. Don't read the Bible carefully. It'll, it'll throw your theology on its head if you're not careful. That's just an aside. The first thing, though, that we saw in order to have revival was for people to see a need. And the second thing we're going to emphasize, and we've seen it a little bit before, the second thing we will emphasize this evening in Ezra chapter 8 is the importance of God's testimony or the testimony of God's name. The importance of the testimony of God's name. Remember what Nehemiah said when he presented the need to Israel to rebuild the walls? Remember what he said? What was the word he used regarding how they looked? What? Reproach. He said, we're a reproach. God, we make you look bad. God, we make you look bad. Christian, listen to me tonight, will you please? It's important we as believers are concerned about how we make God look to people that don't know God. Paul puts it this way in writing his epistles. He said, you know, if you're going to be buffeted, make sure it's not for your own faults. In other words, if you've done evil and you're buffeted or you're punished because of it, it's not for the testimony of Christ that you're suffering. You're suffering because you're evil. You know, we need to take very, very seriously, especially with regard to the lost, the testimony of Christ. There ought to be Christians that speak up loud and clear against individuals at a reproach to the name of Jesus. We ought to loudly condemn the likes of Creflo Dollar and Joel Osteen and individuals that obviously their Christianity is all about dollars and not about a relationship with an almighty God. And by the same token, we ought to loudly condemn individuals in nearer circles to us that depend more on the arm of the flesh than upon God. It's tragic to me when I watch believers in churches violate biblical principles and get themselves in trouble and then have to violate more biblical principles in order to keep themselves afloat. Let me give you for instance. I think... I think that it's unwise for a church to spend money beyond its means. Anybody agree with me about that? I think it's unwise for a church to spend beyond its means. I have never said in our ministry that we'll never borrow money for anything, but I can't foresee circumstances where we would unless it were just something like an asset uh, that we could bail on and be better off even if we walked away from it, or unless it were something where literally it would be cheaper for us uh, than say, okay, for instance, if we went back when we were paying rent, we didn't have a facility, okay, so we had to pay 1208 a month plus utilities, say we could buy something for $500 a month, it would actually be cheaper than um, in a circumstance like that than paying rent. But uh, I still would want to get out of debt within a year or within a certain amount of time. So I've never said we'll never get in debt, but I've always thought, you know what, we could sure get in trouble if we did. And I've seen churches do it. I've seen churches get far more in debt than, their, than the assets that the organization owns is worth. And you know what I've seen those same churches do? I, I'm thinking of two churches right now that I know of that got themselves in debt and had to change how they preached the Word of God and how they attracted people just because they owed money. 
In other words, they felt like I got to be careful we don't preach too hard or people won't like it and they'll leave and we can't have people leave because we couldn't pay our bills. You know, they kind of become a laughing stock in my mind, don't you think so? Uh, they have to embrace methods, they have to function like a business that has to stay afloat. My friend, that's a reproach. I've seen churches develop Sunday school classes like you would uh, a theme park. I mean, basically, they built they built their programs in their church and their facilities like you would a theme park. Why do churches need a restaurant in their facilities? Why would a church why would a church put a restaurant in their facilities and keep it open to the public? To make money. Why would a church, well, we don't have to go on and on and on about it, but why would a church do that? You say, well, that's just because they're trying to be cool. No, because they're trying to make it. That's why. And at some point, people look at that and say, you know what, that's nothing but a farce. That, that isn't God. They're doing things with the arm of the flesh. Here tonight we see in our passage of Scripture that the king has actually given the instruments to the people. Ezra has numbered the people. He's actually tallied up the people that are going to go into Jerusalem. And they're at the river, this river, and they've stopped there and they're organizing and planning on going in. And Ezra mentions, he said, we took time, we stopped, and we were burdened about something and we fasted and we prayed about it. And that matter that he mentions that they fasted and prayed about was something that just occurred to him. I guess the question presented itself to Ezra somewhat like this. Do I trust God or do I trust the king? Is God able to do things or is only the king able to do something? And then he thought, I think, I wonder what the king thinks about my God on the basis of what I say versus what I do. Here's the question. Can God do anything? See, Ezra said, I told the king God can do anything. And I said, uh, could you send me a band of soldiers to keep us safe? God can protect us from any evil. Could you give me some soldiers? <laughs> God is able... To provide for my needs, could I borrow some money? In other words, what he said God is able to do and what he's considering asking for are contradictions. And let's read it. Do you think, before we read it, do you think it might be dangerous to have vessels of gold and silver and a whole lot of cash traveling through a desolate area where pretty much everybody that passes through gets shaken down and rocked. Is that dangerous? Okay. So that was the concern. Look at verse 22. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king saying the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. He said, so he told the king that God blesses and takes care of people that are faithful to him and that God uh, destroys people that forsake him. In verse 23, he said, so we fasted and besought our God for this and he was entreated of us. Do we trust God or do we trust man? That's the question. The first thing that we see is that Ezra was convicted that I need to trust God and not trust man. The second thing that we see, verses 24 through 30, is that he acted on what he said he believed. He said, Then I separated twelve of the chief of the priests, and he goes to list them, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brethren, and I weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I even weighed into their hands 650 talents of silver. I think a talent is what, like 75 pounds? So, so I think that's right. I think it's 75 pounds of silver. I may be off a little on that. 
But 650 times 75 pounds of silver, that's a good bit of silver. Um, silver vessels, 100 talents, and of gold, 100 talents. Can you imagine 750 pounds of gold? Might marauders, might crooks, not only be aware that they had this kind of wealth, but consider taking it from them? Would this be a dangerous procession to take this kind of wealth and travel through wild forsaken country without soldiers to guard you? How dangerous. And I said unto them, verse 28, You are holy unto the Lord. The vessels are holy also. The silver and the gold are a free will offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Watch ye and keep them and take away them before the chief of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers of Israel and Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. Notice verse 28, the consecration. This stuff belongs to God. Now one of the best things you can do in order to protect something from evil is to give it to God. God, this is yours. Uh, I love it the way that, uh, yeah, you guys ever watched the pineapple story? You know what I'm talking about? The man that grew pineapples. And I'm not saying it's a great it's a funny story. It's, it, there's some helpful truth in it. The man that had pineapples and he was a missionary ended up hating the people that he was ministering to because they kept stealing his pineapples before they were ripe. And he got him really mad and he realized, that, you know, that, hey, I don't like people, they don't like me. And so he gave his pineapples to God. He gave his bananas to God. And... Um, Instead of people stealing his stuff, he, he, they said, you know, why aren't you mad anymore? Why aren't you this? Why aren't you that? And he said, well, I gave my pineapples to God. If you steal my pineapples, you're stealing them from God. Well, God started judging them when they stole the pineapples. Started dealing with them. And pretty soon, you know, no, they wouldn't touch the pineapples for anything. Because you don't steal pineapples from God. <laughs> and you know, it's really true that if we make our problems God problems... God's promise. In other words, if I belong to God, then if something evil happens to me when I'm trusting God, who looks bad, me or God? I mean, if I, I'm not, not in word, but if in action I trust God, who is responsible for His testimony? God is. And that is precisely what Ezra has done. He has consecrated the people. He said, now, we're not going to count this until you get to where you're going and we're going to count it. So he, he, he made a count of it. There's no way that the people uh, that he'd entrusted to carry the treasure would be able to abscond any because he was accounted for how much there was. And he said, you're consecrated to God. Now go carry this stuff. Now how would you like, if I had a backpack full of gold and I had you walk uh, through a place where people knew what you had and where people were crooked and dishonest? There are certain places in the world when I would rather be penniless than have a great amount of wealth. You know what I mean? I mean, if, you know, uh, you notice I'm not like a blingy guy. I don't wear a Rolex wristwatch. I keep that at home. I don't wear all my gold rings. I keep them at home. I'm kidding about that. I don't have a lot of gold rings. But I don't wear a lot of blingy stuff, first of all, because I want to look like, you know, a person who decorates themselves the way that ladies do. I don't want to be a sissy. So I don't wear necklaces or bracelets or chains or gold or anything like that. <laughs> Frankly, holding it up. Okay. So anyway, I don't want to be a sissy. I don't wear that kind of stuff. But secondly, you know, I don't have to worry about people taking something from me that I don't have. Uh, a lot of times, I leave my vehicle unlocked because I don't want the windows broken out of it for people when they want to get in to steal my stuff. I figure it would be better for them to get in with the door unlocked, then break into it because it do less damage because I don't have anything worth stealing in my vehicle. You understand what the, the thought process? Okay. There are places I would not want to carry a oh, 100 talents of gold to. And so Ezra gave this to the people and he consecrated it to them. He said, okay, now you're going to carry it to the land. It was an action. It was a step of faith. It literally was taking what you said you believed and practicing it. If we're ever going to have revival in the church, we're going to have to do what we say 
we believe. For there to be revival, we need to do what we say we believe. You trust God? You trust God? Some of the uh, young people were asking me about Halloween beforehand. They said, you know, I said, what's bad about Halloween? Well, it's the devil's holiday. It's a holiday commemorating, celebrating the devil. So the question is, should we do it? Should we, should we participate in Halloween? I don't want to give place to the devil. I shouldn't, should I? But is Halloween fun for a lot of people? Yes. I'll be honest with you, it doesn't appeal to me, but it's fun for a lot of people, and I acknowledge that, I recognize that. So what do we do about it? Well, let's do this. Let's say that we trust God, and then let's act like we don't. Because the question is, could, could we have fun and not do Halloween? Could the joy of the Lord be our strength? Could spiritual things be as good as candy? Could God give us candy without us having to participate in giving place to the devil? And the truth of the matter is, is that I really don't know whether you believe it or not until I see what you do. You can either believe God is better than the devil, or you can just believe that, you know what? I just got to do this. I just don't see how this could be removed from my life. A lot of Christians won't give things up, won't get things out of their lives because they just don't believe that anything God could do would be better. And they'll say God's better. God's good. Adults do this so much when it comes to faithfulness. They know that there are things, there are percentages, at least, of their lives that ought to be service to the Lord, don't they? And yet, they don't have time for most of the things because they have to work, or they have this or that, the things that really displace the same. And you know the lost know all about being honest when it comes to us. They're not honest about themselves, but they're pretty honest about us. And if you claim that you believe God can provide for you, why don't you act like you? like he can. And this is precisely what Ezra is dealing with. He said, you know, I was convicted that if I told God, or if I told the king, that God blesses people who trust him, and God protects people who trust him, and then I ask for soldiers to protect us, that that would be a contradiction between what I said and what I do. And that would be bad for the testimony of Jesus. And so he trusted God. And then we see the happy ending to the story, verse 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go on to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and He delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay wait in the way. He said, so I prayed about it, and then I acted on it, and I found out that what I said to the king was actually true about God. You know, most of us know things about God. We say we believe the things about God. But until we act on them, they're nothing more than things we know and we say we believe. But we don't really know if they're even true. You know, the average Christian doesn't really know if God could answer prayer. don't know whether God really could answer prayer. You don't know if God really could provide. Don't know if God really could fill in the blank. Because what the Word of God says, and what you say you believe, you've got a fancy way of getting around actually acting upon. And that little bit about the testimony of God's name is something we need to get serious about if we're ever going to see revival. Father, I pray that you would convict us and allow this truth to penetrate 
our thick heads and our hard hearts. We pray in Jesus' name.